Hello again. In this video I'll be converting this HP 8300 into a budget gaming PC. I'll be installing an NVMe SSD as a boot drive, which does require BIOS modding. I'll also install a GTX 960 GPU and Windows 11, even though this PC doesn't meet the minimum requirements for it. After that I'll see how some games run on this PC. To get the motherboard out of the case, all 10 screws need to be taken out, as well as the CPU cooler screws, as they're also attached to the case. When the motherboard is moved over into the new case, you can use some nuts to mount the CPU cooler. Because the HP PC doesn't come with a standard backplate, I created a backplate from scraps of an old plastic box. A backplate is of course completely optional, you can leave it without one if you want. For this case swap I'll be using the stock 320W PSU, and this PSU is not an ATX standard PSU, so it won't fit all ATX cases. It has different measurements and different mounting holes compared to an ATX PSU. So to mount this PSU I had to drill two additional mounting holes to the back of the case. It's quite a mess of cables here, so let's see one by one what we have here. CPU 4 pin, it wouldn't reach, so I had to use an extender. Next, these two white connectors go from the PSU to the motherboard, and power goes through them to the motherboard. And then power leaves from the motherboard to the devices via these two 4 pin cables that have black connectors. To use the GTX 960 in this PC I need this 6 pin connector and I have here an adapter that converts two SATA power connectors to one 6 pin power connector. If I was using a lower powered GPU like a 1050 Ti, I'd be comfortable using one SATA to 6 pin adapter, but since the 960 needs more power, better share the load between two SATA power connectors. Then I have one SATA to two Molex adapter here, which is used to power the fans, which have Molex power connectors. Also the HDD and the DVD drive are powered by SATA power cables. The case front panel USB 2 is connected to the black header on the motherboard, which has media written next to it. I took the original front panel USB connectors from the HP case and they're connected to these green and yellow headers. They are inside the case so I can't use those original front USB ports but they need to be connected to these two headers otherwise the PC will give errors at startup. And the front panel audio connector is connected to this header. The DVD drive and HDD are connected with SATA data cables and the power button cable is connected here. Since this PC has an internal speaker, I decided to move it over into the new case. I'll be mounting it to the side panel. Here is the NVMe SSD which will be our boot drive. It's connected into a PCIe X16 adapter and that adapter is connected into PCIe X16 extender. This kind of an extender is needed if you want to use both an NVMe SSD and a GPU on the PC simultaneously. Because the white X4 slot the SSD needs to connect to is too close to the black X16 slot that the GPU needs to connect to. Even with the adapter there wasn't enough space and I had to cut the black shroud of the GPU to fit both the SSD and the graphics card. By the way if you're wondering why my RAM is in the wrong slots it's because the CPU is defective and only one RAM channel is working on this CPU. I tested with another i3 CPU and with that all the RAM slots did work. So it's the CPU that's defective but that's my only third gen i5 so I'm still using that. So that's the reason why my RAM is in the wrong slots. Normally if you use 
two RAM sticks, you either use the white or the black slots in order to have it work in dual channel mode. Even though all the adapters and the modification I made to the shroud of the graphics card, I still need to apply some force in order to get the GPU in place. I couldn't really figure out better way to mount the SSD, so I just used a zip tie. This probably doesn't look like a good mounting solution, but I tested it and it doesn't seem to be able to short out anything, it's only touching the black plastic shroud of the GPU. In order to be able to boot from the NVMe drive, you need an NVMe driver in the BIOS. And with these instructions, I was able to add the driver into my BIOS. So all credit goes to Paul Murana and his blog tachytelic.net. These instructions are for the SFF version, but they did work for the configurable mini tower I have. Only do this BIOS modification if you're comfortable doing something like this. With BIOS modifications, a tiniest mistake can easily render the PC unusable. This cable with the blue header is not connected to anything. It's only there because it's in the same part as the original front panel USB, which does need to be connected in order for the PC not to give errors at boot up. I attach the internal speaker into the side panel. In the front panel it would have been more hidden, but the front panel is completely taken up by the fans. In order to get around the minimum requirements of Windows 11 that this PC does not meet, I created the installation USB stick with a software called Rufus. With it you can automatically disable the requirements as well as automatically create a local account and other stuff that makes installing Windows 11 much more fast and much less tedious. In order to find out if the stock HP PSU can handle all this hardware, I simultaneously started Prime95 torture test and Mark Fire Strike and the power consumption seemed to stabilize at around 210 watts, so I think the 320 watt PSU is enough. First game I tested was Valorant, and it turns out that Valorant doesn't launch on Windows 11 if there's no TPM 2.0. On Windows 10 it doesn't require the TPM 2.0, so people with older PCs without the TPM can play on Windows 10 for now. But as Windows 10 support will be phased out, people with older PCs won't be able to play Valorant, I guess, and I think one of the most common reasons to play Valorant is that it runs well on older PCs. Which is why requiring TPM 2.0 doesn't seem like the smartest move from Riot Games. They'll be getting rid of a big part of their player base. What do I know anyway? Actually this PC has a TPM, but it's only 1.2 and it cannot be updated to the 2.0 like can be done on some other models of HP PCs, cause this model is not supported, which kinda sucks. Especially taking into account the PC's age, PMNG drive does work very well and seems to be playable at 1080p low, it does seem that the average FPS is somewhere between 45 and 50.
next I benchmark Counter Strike 2 and if you watch this video much later this is when this game has just been released and it's very buggy and there are issues running it also using newer hardware. I was supposed to enable the NVIDIA performance overlay but I guess I didn't so there's no FPS counters. It was borderline playable offline but FPS was regularly dipping down to 40 so I don't think it would have been a nice experience to play online. Fortnite running in DirectX 11 mode and in 1080p resolution did seem to be very playable with FPS averaging probably over 60 and for more FPS one could always enable the performance mode.